in plain where Abram and Lot were, and uh, they rebelled against Kedali Omar. And a battle took place in Siddam, that is the south end of the Salt Sea, or what is known today, the Dead Sea. There is, there's something here that we need to maybe take note of, and that is the fact that there has been war on the earth since the beginning of time, and this time, this age will end in war. Unfortunately, that is the effect of sin in the lives of the people that God made and then rebelled against him, fell in the garden, and, and this is what we see. So we are all alarmed by Russia attacking Ukraine, and there are other wars around the world, and it's not going to get any better. We can read from Genesis to Revelation. Uh, I had set out to count all the battles that are recorded just in the Bible, and I, I didn't finish, so I don't have a number, but there's a lot. And here we have in Genesis 14, 4,000 years ago, a battle, five kings against four in the 20th century. The 20th century has been called the bloodiest century in human history. More people died because of war in the 20th century than in any previous century, and it ain't getting any better. We know in Revelation 19 that this whole age will end in a battle. We read there in Revelation 19 that Christ will descend on a white horse, and we understand Revelation to be communicated in many mysterious signs and symbols, but that white horse, we know, is a picture of victory as Christ returns to set everything straight, to lay waste to this planet. We're told in 2 Peter chapter 3 that he will create a new heaven and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. And all of God's people long for that day because we're pretty sick of this old sin-cursed world and the, even the remnants of sin that live within us. We cry out, Maranatha, Lord, come and restore all things. But Christ must come as a warrior to wage war against all evil. And by the way, the battle of Armageddon is no battle because it says in Revelation that he smites them with the breath of his nostrils. A new heaven and a new earth is created out of the burned out ashes of this old one and you will live in a global, universal paradise created by God for you. But hang on, because we're not there yet, and this world has gone a little crazy. Revelation 20, or that should be Matthew 24, sorry about the wrong quote there. You will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not frightened, and are human nature is to react in fear. But remember, Christians, that fear is the opposite of faith. Trust in the Lord. Times are not going to get better. They're going to get worse. But keep your eyes fixed on Christ. He'll see, he's already seen you through some really difficult days in your own life personally. So as we trust in him, we will get through it. Now, during these wars, Lot was captured, verses 11 and 12. Then they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their food supply and departed. They also took Lot, Abram's nephew, and his possessions and departed, for he was living in Sodom. Here's the sad thing about Lot. And I, we talked about this on a number of occasions already me personally, I would not have known that Lot was a man of God unless we were told that in 2 Peter. And it says in 2 Peter that his righteous soul was disturbed by the evil that he saw around him. I mean, my thoughts are, well, why don't you move? <laughs> he lived in Sodom, one of the most wicked cities in ancient times. 
God works throughout human history in many different ways. He gives warning judgments to peoples, individuals, nations, even kings. We should look at this attack of these four kings upon the five, including Sodom and Gomorrah, as a warning judgment by God. But unheeded warning judgments are followed by final judgment, at least in this world. And we know the the sad and terrible end of Sodom and Gomorrah. They returned to their city. Lot returned to Sodom. Why would you do that? Learn what God wants to teach you through your trials. Let your trials work for you. And Lot didn't hear the warning. He didn't heed the warning. Now, remember, Abram and Lot had separated because their their worldly goods, their their flocks, and and all that they had attained in this world was so great, the land couldn't support both of them. So Lot was a rich man, and he moved into the Jordan Valley where Sodom and Gomorrah were, and he chose to live there. We will read in chapter 19, that when he left, he, he left with the shirt on his back, and that's it. He lost everything in this world. His desire, when Abram gave him the choice, you choose, go to the left, and I'll go to the right, or vice versa, and he, he saw the lush valley there. He said, surely that's the best place to live. I can prosper there and grow wealthier. He considered his economic future instead of his spiritual future. And he ended up getting neither. He didn't grow spiritually. And he lost everything in this world. Repeated cycles of sin stunt our spiritual growth. Listen, if you've been wrestling with something in your life, and you're in this little hamster wheel just going round and round and round, get out. Just stop it. Stop the craziness in your life. Make a change. I think of Paul's encouragement to first century saints, make no provision for the flesh. Lot made provision for the flesh living in Sodom. So whatever is uh, something that you're working on in your own life, you know that you need to change or give it up or change your behavior, start doing something you haven't been doing or stop doing something you have, whatever it is for you, just stop and talk to the Lord. I know you're weak, me too, but God is strong. Amen. And when you lay your burdens before the Lord, I mean, that's the beautiful picture in Pilgrim's Progress is he takes that backpack, which is such a weight to him, and he throws it at the foot of the cross, and he feels free and light. This life doesn't have to be heavy and hard if you cast your cares upon Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. Some of us had to, when we became a Christian, we had to to change the crowd that we hung out with because they wouldn't uh, listen to our presentation of the gospel and they only were trying to drag us back into our old life. Now we're in the world, and we need to be a light to the world, and that means we can't cloister ourselves off into a monastery. Uh, What good is the light if it's under a basket? So we're out in the world, in the darkness, shining for Christ. But make sure that the flow is going the right way. And if it's not, then make a change. If you're being a a positive effect on the world, then stay where you're at. If you're not, if the world's having a negative effect on you, it's time to change cities, Lot. And same for you and me. Then in verse 13, Then a fugitive came and told Abram the Hebrew, 
First time that word's used in the Bible. Now, he was living by the oaks of Mamre, the Amorite, brother of Eshcol, and brother of Aner, and these were allies with Abram. So we remember the journey that Abram made. He lived in Ur. He crossed. He made this long journey. I think we said it was 1,400 miles on foot. Yeah, that's possible. And he ended up in Shechem. The word habaru, linguists have been wrestling with that word for centuries, and there is some agreement that it means something to the effect of one who has crossed over or one from the other side. That's exactly what Abram was. The people in the Jordan Valley knew that Abram wasn't a local. He had come from the other side of the Euphrates. He was the man from the other side. He was the Habaru, Hebrew. That's what Joshua, the Lord says in Joshua 24, I took your father Abram, Abraham from beyond the Euphrates River. That was kind of his identification. There was a line that ran through the middle, almost exactly through the middle of Abram's life chronologically, On one side of that line was his old life in Ur, as an idol worshiper. Why did God choose Abram? Because God chose to choose Abram, the idol worshiper. What did Abram contribute to his salvation? He was the sinner. That's his contribution. For by grace you are saved through faith that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Your salvation was given to you as a gift of God, if indeed you are saved. So on one side was his old life as an idol worshiper in Ur. On the other side of that line, and for Abram it was a, it was a river, on the other side of that river was his new life as a true worshiper of the one true God. It is astonishing that, I mean, not a whole lot of time had elapsed from uh, Noah and his sons and their wives coming out of the ark and the world just degrading into as bad as it was before the flood. And by all accounts, there were very few, if any, who knew about the one true God. We talked about Nimrod and his tower and the, the, the god that they worshipped there was the moon god, Nana. They worshipped everything but the one true God. God grabbed a hold of Abram, gave him faith to believe, regenerated his spiritually dead heart and made him a true believer in him. If you're here today and you believe in Jesus Christ, that's what God did. Your whole salvation was a gift. And you should praise God that he plucked you out of this world. I don't know about you, but I wasn't saved until uh, I was 25. And I was, I, I got pretty bad. And God saved me. Anne Marie was saved. Uh, she and I were saved a year after we got married. Life was tough our first year of marriage as unbelievers. We struggled. Even after we received Christ, it was a struggle because we were learning everything for the first time. We didn't have a clue about how to raise kids or how to love each other, much less how to love the Lord. But if, if God plucked you out of the world. He will grow you up in Christ. I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. Philippians 1.6. That's a promise. Is there a line running through your life? Can you, can you look at your life and say, okay, this is the old me, and then... God stepped in and grabbed me out of the world. And this is my new life in Christ. 
Has your life changed? Can, can you see a dramatic change, at least in your thinking? Or you actually love God. For me, that's the biggest miracle in my life, that God could take this old sinner, shaking his fist at God, mad at the world, could open up those hands and turn them into hands of praise. That God could make me a worshiper. I say there's, as someone has said, there's no nut so hard that God can't crack it. Maybe you're one of those nuts. If God is tugging at your heart, just let him work on you. Don't resist. Let the Lord have you. And you'll have the best life that you've ever had. Someone has said, you know, being a Christian is just, you know, God, God doesn't want you to have any fun. That was the view of the Puritans. People said of the Puritans, and it was not true, that uh, the Puritans felt like if there was someone that was happy in the Lord, happy in the world anywhere, then, you know, they, that was bad. Listen, the greatest joy that I've ever experienced is since I received Christ. Those old days before Christ were not good old days. It was wasted time. Turn to Christ. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old life is replaced by a new life in Christ. That's the Steve Hildebrandt Revised Standard Edition. Then in 14 through 16, when Abram heard that his relative had been taken captive, he let out his trained men born in his house, 318. He divided his forces against them by night, and he and his servants, and defeated them, and also brought back his relative Lot with his possessions. What in the world? 318, you're telling me 318 men defeated four armies. What could 318 men do? What could they not do if God is for them? The Lord would say through Joshua, one of your men puts to flight a thousand for the Lord your God is he who fights for you. Christianity is not necessarily popular. And to be a Christian isn't necessarily make you the most popular person. But listen, whatever God has called you to do, if your cause is just, then it doesn't matter how many people are against you. It doesn't matter. Think of Gideon. He had all these soldiers. He sounds the alarm. Hey, we need to, we need to raise the army because we're being attacked. And thousands show up. And the Lord says, you got too many, Gideon. What? We need as many as we can get. And all these things that God gave to Gideon to reduce the size of his army till they, he got down to 300. That's ridiculous. And yet, God and Gideon and those 300 won the battle. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Trust in the Lord, Christian. If, you're, if your cause is just, if your heart is right, if your desire is to glorify God, it doesn't matter who's against you. Go forward. Obey the Lord. Listen to God. And he will bless your path. And then there is this 10th king. I mean, this is a mystery. He just... God opens the door. We see this guy for a couple verses, and then he disappears. We never hear about him again. And there's one statement about him in Psalm 110, and then not until the New Testament in Hebrews do we hear about him again. But actual appearance, a couple verses. There's some different ideas about who he was. Let's look at the, the text itself, Melchizedek by translation of his name, means king of righteousness, Malki Tzedek, king of righteousness. He was the king of Salem, Shalem is how it would be pronounced, 
which is equivalent to the Hebrew word shalom, which means peace. King of peace, king of righteousness. Salem would be renamed under David Jerusalem. And he was priest of God Most High. That's the first time that name has been given in the Bible. So this guy, Melchizedek, shows up out of nowhere and he blesses Abram, who's a worshiper of El Elyon, God Most High. Abram's like, that's a good name for God. Because it's true. There's lots of gods, man-made gods, in the nations around me, but our God is the Most High God. There's a lot of conjecture on who Melchizedek was. One scroll in the Qumran scrolls that were discovered says he was the archangel Michael. The Talmud, one, one uh, Jewish author about 500 AD said he was Shem. Now Shem actually was alive during the time of uh, Abram, so he would have been the oldest living patriarch on the earth at that time. So someone says, Melchizedek was Shem. Others, especially the Bible, says in Hebrews 5 through 7, chapters 5 through 7, that Melchizedek was a foreshadow of Christ. And still others say, no, this, this was Christ himself, a Christophany. Christ, before his incarnation in human flesh, appearing to Abram. Well, go home and read, especially Hebrews chapter 7. It's pretty clear that this individual was not an angel. He was not Shem, and he was not Christ in a Christophany, but he was a foreshadow of Christ, a foreshadow of Messiah who was to come. Now think about that. God caused this person to be born and the specific purpose for his life was to be a priest and a king of a little tiny city, really of no account, and to, and to cross paths with Abram at this one moment in time and bless Abram in the name of El Elyon and to receive a tithe from Abram. King of peace, king of righteousness. And he was a foreshadow of someone who wouldn't even come for 4,000 years. What? Amazing. I mean, I mean we, could, we could talk a long time about this. There's, there's one other thing here that I think kind of seals the deal for me, that this is a picture of Christ. He brought out bread and wine. What is that a picture of? New covenant, sacraments. Um, this is a picture of Christ. It's pointing to Christ. God, from the beginning of time, all the way through the Old Testament up to the time of Christ, just giving to us all these amazing pictures and foreshadows and prophecies of this Messiah who was to come. So that when he came, we might know this is the guy and that we could put all of our hope in him for our salvation. So here we have mysterious, yes, but rich foreshadow of Christ. Way back in Genesis 14. Hebrews 7 says, This Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of Most High God, was made like the Son of God. God raised up this guy. I'm going to make you in such a way that you will be this beautiful picture of my son who's coming but not for a very long time. All right. Let's wrap this up. 
the world will be at war until Christ comes. He's not going to come as the Prince of Peace. He's going to come to wage war, Revelation 19 says. There's kind of a line in the sand. Which side of that line do you stand on? Christ is either to you a warrior, an enemy, or he is the Prince of Peace. So Christ is coming back to restore this broken universe, to make a new universe in which peace and righteousness will dwell. So don't be surprised by the wars. They're, we were told they would happen. In this world, you will have tribulation. Fear not, I've overcome the world, Jesus said. So have faith, not fear. Let your trials work for you. Unlike Lot, he didn't get the warning. Why are you living in the city? He got taken captive because he lived in a pagan city, and not just kind of pagan, but grossly pagan. And he got swept away in this warning judgment. Let your mistakes work for you. Lord, what are you, what are you trying to teach me through this difficulty that's happening in my life. What step forward toward you can I take? That's the right question. Like Abram, I think we each need to look at whether there truly is a line across our lives somewhere. And if there's not, God knows and you know. And why not just come before the Lord and, and say, God, there hasn't been any change in my life. I know the facts about you, but I don't know you. If that thought is even occurring in your life, I think the Holy Spirit is tugging at you to come to know Christ. And like Abram, we can have courage in these last days. Jesus said, if they hated me, they're going to hate you. And we're seeing just this meanness in general, but especially towards Christians and Christianity and Christ and the church. But don't worry about all that. You, you don't need the world's approval. You just keep doing what you're doing if it's right. Live for Christ. And then finally, Melchizedek, way back in Genesis 14 here, beautiful picture and foreshadow of Christ, pointing us to Christ, the Old Testament pointing us to Christ. Messiah is coming. Over the centuries, the prophecies get richer and richer and fuller. We have more details. We learn about what tribe and, and where he will be born and all of these wonderful details. You can put all your hope in him and you will not be disappointed. A lot of us have trusted in people, in promises, and all sorts of other things, and we've been let down. But the one who trusts in Christ will not be disappointed. You can put all your hope in him with no contingency plan, no backup plan, but all your hope for eternal life in Christ, and you will not be disappointed. Trust in the Lord, friend. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. He will not let you down. Let's stand. Heavenly Father, we, we want to trust you. We want to believe you more. Increase our faith. Help us believe, Lord. Produce faith in these old hearts of ours that we can trust you more. We thank you for your word, Lord, which is a light and lamp to our feet. I pray, Lord, this week that we would be bold as lions to be a light for Jesus Christ in a sin-sick world. Help us, Lord. We are weak, but you are almighty God. And so we have great hope that since the right man is on our side, our striving will not be losing. We praise you and we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.